Our next section of interest is going to be section 4.10, uh, but this is not 4.10 from the textbook that we are using Calculus Volume 2. This is 4.10 from Calculus Volume 1. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're using section numbers here. Um, the reason that we're looking at this section next is that we have this theorem, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, which says if you want to compute the integral, if you want to find some area underneath a curve, then what you can do instead is take a antiderivative of the function that you're trying to integrate, and once you take that antiderivative, you can just evaluate it at two points and subtract. So this is a really nice way of computing areas, but right now we don't have a lot of tools that help us undo the derivative process. We don't have a lot of tools that help us find antiderivatives. So section 4.10 is exactly going to give us some of those starting tools that we can use to, to do this anti-derivation process. So reminder uh, that for a function f of x, an antiderivative of f of x is some function, it's a new function which we'll call a of x, uh, whose derivative is the function that you're, that you're trying to anti-derive. So it is the opposite of derivative. One thing that we want to remember is that antiderivatives are not unique. In particular, uh, x cubed over 3 and x cubed over 3 plus 1 are antiderivatives of x squared. If you take the derivative of x cubed over 3, your power rule says uh, bring down the 3 and uh, reduce the exponent by 1. So you do that and the 3 uh, cancels and you're left with x squared. If you take the derivative of x cubed plus 1, you get the exact same thing in this term. You get that x squared out, and the derivative of an added constant is 0. So this plus 1 goes away, and you're also left with x squared in the end. So we find that a function can have multiple antiderivatives, and in fact, you can create your own uh, antiderivatives. You can create some additional ones here by also noting that... Uh, so is x cubed over 1 minus 1, uh, x cubed, oops, not over 1, over 3, x cubed over 3 plus pi, uh, x cubed over 3 plus uh, a million, or a 1 with a bunch of zeros after it, um, and whatever, whatever constant you want to add to x cubed over 3, uh, that's another antiderivative of x squared. So there's a question, though, of is this all of them? Uh, you know, are there any more antiderivatives that maybe don't even have x cubed over 3 in them at all? Um, so we have this question of how do we find all of the antiderivatives of, of x squared? So maybe we want to take a look at this, and we want to think, well, let's, let's suppose uh, a of x and b of x are antiderivatives, antiderivatives, oof, antiderivatives, why is this green? Of x squared. Well then what we're going to notice is let's, let's maybe take a look at the function a of x minus b of x for a moment. And let's think about its derivative. So the derivative of this function a minus b, well, that's dA dx minus dB dx by our derivative rules. And, well, dA dx, since a is an antiderivative of x squared, its derivative is x squared. Uh, db dx, well, b is also an antiderivative of x squared, so its derivative is x squared, and x squared minus x squared is 0. So what we find is that this function here, a minus b, is, uh, has derivative 0. And if we think, well, what does it mean to have derivative 0? Well, derivative 0 means that you have constant, um, that, that your function is constant. Uh, it means that your function isn't changing at all because you have 0 slope everywhere. So if the derivative of, if, so if a minus b is constant, maybe we could call a of x minus b of x equal to some constant c. And rearranging this equation, this tells me that a of x equals b of x plus some constant. 
So for instance, if I took a of x equal to x cubed over 3, that tells me that every other function, no matter what b of x is, uh, it has to be, um, I guess maybe I should have written this differently. Uh, let's, let's call b of x x cubed over 3. We can, we can do that. b of x is x cubed over 3. This tells me that a of x has to be equal to x cubed over 3 plus some constant c. And this is what we're going to find in general. There's nothing special about x squared here. You could replace x squared by your favorite function in the world, and you would find that any two antiderivatives differ by a constant. In other words, we have this following theorem. If a of x is an antiderivative of f of x, and b of x is also an antiderivative of f of x, then there is a constant c, which is a real number. Uh, there is a constant c in R so that a of x is b of x plus that constant c. Every antiderivative of any given function, uh, once you find one, the rest of the antiderivatives are just constants added to that one. So let's think about maybe how we should write antiderivatives before we actually go on to doing any examples. So our notation is going to be, uh, well, we, we have this fundamental theorem of calculus, which has something to do with antiderivatives. And the fundamental theorem of calculus says that uh, if A is an antiderivative of F, then the integral of f of x dx from a to b is a of b minus a of a. And so this tells me that this integral symbol is, is kind of like, it's, it's a symbol that uh, says take an antiderivative. So if we want to not refer to a number, because this right hand side here is some number, you're evaluating at b, evaluating at a, and subtracting. If we want to not refer to a number, but instead a function, maybe we could use the same symbol on the left-hand side here, but not, not write that a or that b. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use this integral symbol of f of x dx to mean all of the antiderivatives of f. So we're going to start using this integral symbol to just mean antiderivatives. When we put limits of integration on there, like a and b, that's when we're referring to the definite integral, which is the number. If we don't have any limits of integration there, so if we're not using a, an a or a b, this is going to refer to the collection of antiderivatives, um, which is why we're going to call it an indefinite integral. It doesn't have a particular answer, it has a family of answers. So that's our introduction to antiderivatives. We'll begin the next video with talking about some actual examples.